Hello and welcome to Power Up Hawaii, where Hawaii comes together to walk towards a clean, renewable, and just energy future. I am your host, Raya Salter. I'm an energy attorney, clean energy advocate, and community outreach specialist. I'm also the principal attorney of Imagine Power LLC. Today we're going to take a look at important energy and utility news from Hawaii, around the country, and the world as reported in the last week. First, let's take a look at some recent developments in clean energy and clean energy policy in the islands. Now, to mark Earth Day on April 22nd, the Hawaiian Electric Companies published several stats touting the utility's clean energy programs. As reported by Green Tech Media, Hawaiian Electric Companies reached a new milestone in 2016, with 26% of the electricity used by customers coming from renewable sources, up, for up from 23% the year before. On the island of Hawaii, renewable electricity use surpassed the halfway mark for the first time, reaching 54%, up from 49% in 2015. Maui reached a record high of 37% last year, and 19% of electricity used by customers came from renewable resources on Oahu. So when it comes to the types of renewable resources in the company's energy mix, Customer-owned solar dominates with 34% of renewable energy generated last year, followed by wind at 29% and biomass in third at 19%. Earlier this month, regulators reopened the grid supply program by removing projects from the queue that had been approved but never completed. So estimates show around 20 megawatts of grid supply capacity is now available for customers of the three companies, representing about 2,800 private rooftop solar systems. The Hawaiian Electric Companies report hundreds of applications are already in line for processing and will be processed in the order in which they were received and only as capacity becomes available through October 21st, 2017. Now, some, from 2008 to 2016, all three companies collectively cut their oil use in generators from 10.7 million barrels to 8.5 million barrels, a 21% decrease. On Oahu, where energy demands are at, the, at their highest, Hawaiian Electric's oil use fell from 7.8 million barrels to 6 million barrels. In Hawaiian Electric Company's territory, the number of registered plug-in electric vehicles has broken the 5,000 mark. That milestone ranks Hawaii second in the nation for EV adoption per capita after California. So we've got uh, Earth Day and we've got HECO um, really reporting on what is uh, quite remarkable um, renewable energy penetration. I think um, so many folks in the sector are uh, looking to push HECO. I think HECO takes a lot of heat. Um, folks want to see them reform, and they want to see them reform faster, but I, for one, think that it's great that um, he, the HECO companies took this opportunity to sort of really show how much it is they're doing on clean and renewable energy, um, and as a state that has a tremendously high rate of um, uh, rooftop solar, um, they are doing, I think, what many may say is a tremendous job. So congratulations, HECO, for celebrating your accomplishments on Earth Day. More HECO news. HECO and New Jersey's NRG have signed a 22-year PPA for what will be the largest solar facility in the state. Now, this was reported by PV Tech. A 49-megawatt solar array will be located on the north shore of Oahu on Kamehameha School's own land near Haleiwa. It will be built and owned by NRG and targeted to come online in 2019. HECO will purchase the electricity generated by the facility at 10.99 cents a kilowatt hour with use of the state's tax credit. So this agreement awaits approval from the Hawaii Public Utilities Commission. Uh, in addition to this solar facility, HECO filed PPAs for a 14.7 megawatt project and another 45.9 megawatt um, project also to be built and owned by NRG and scheduled to come online in 2019. So all three solar projects were originally proposed for Sun Edison and acquired by NRG in November 2016 during the former uh, company's bankruptcy proceedings. The current PPA prices were negotiated below the previous Sun Edison prices, which were around 13.5 cents per kilowatt hour. So cumulatively, all three projects total a near 110 megawatts of solar generation. Of course, we know the utility aims to hit 100% renewable energy generation by 2040, 
five years earlier than the initial target of 2045. This also marks NRG's entry into the whole Hawaii utility scale solar market. So this is really interesting. We've got, we've talked for a long time about these projects, these zombie projects, these projects that were left uh, askance by the, the bankruptcy um, sort of coming to life. Now here they come to life with a New Jersey company, NRG. When I was an M&A attorney, I'm in private practice, we, uh, NRG was a client, a very prominent uh, mainland um, energy company. I think it's also worth noting the lower price on the PPA from the old deal. I wasn't in the room when those negotiations were made, but I wonder if simply the time even passing has, um, and, and the continued costs that continue to lower on solar technology had anything to do with you know, bumping down that price. And I think it sort of represents some of the benefits and negatives that can come from uh, getting into long-term PPAs at this time. Uh, I think you might want to think about ways to call an innovation uh, clause, a way to uh, prepare for what happens when a cost may reduce. Might there be a windfall, I think, in this current climate? That wouldn't be a crazy thing to think about. So moving along, more news about Hawaii. Hawaii ranks among the top in the United States for clean energy adoption. As reported by PBN, five. Hawaii is five among the 50 states in the U.S. for shifting to renewable energy, according to a new report. Now this analysis comes to us from the Union of Concerned Scientists, and it was released Thursday. They used 12 metrics to rank states, crediting each state with up to 10 points for each metric, including deployment of renewable energy, energy efficiency in electric vehicles, as well as policies for renewable energy adoption. So Hawaii ranks first in resident residential solar per capita, as we discussed before, and fourth in EV adoption. The uh, Hawaii also ranks in the top 10 um, of the 12 metrics in the uh, Clean Energy Momentum Report. The report said that California is doing the best job transitioning away from fossil fuels to clean energy sources, followed by Vermont and Massachusetts. I like to talk about how Hawaii um, continues to provide national leadership on clean energy. I think when we have the discussions here and we face the challenges um, of energy, um, energy at the food, water, agriculture nexus, um, and also energy as it relates to transportation, uh, you know, there's a lot of frustration. Folks want to see things move forward faster. But I think that it's uh, useful and important to note that Hawaii continues to get recognition nationally for being a forward-looking state. Let's go ahead and talk about something that I think is extremely exciting. Of course, we had the People's Climate March. And of course, we had sister marches in Hawaii for the big march that happened in DC. So hundreds of folks answered the call to march um, in Waikiki for more action on climate change. This happened on Saturday. A lot of people came to protest President Donald Trump's efforts to defund or dismantle efforts to address climate change. Now, the organized rally co coincided with his 100th day in office. Demonstrators held signs warning of dying oceans and climate catastrophe. Some were even in snorkeling gear. Organizers say the president has left environmental protections in tatters. On Friday, the Environmental Protection Agency removed most of the information on climate change from its website to reflect the approach of new leadership. So we had hundreds of sister marches, and we also had marches take place in Hilo and Kona on the Big Island, and perhaps in other places as well. In Denver, protesters braved the snow, while tens and hundreds of thousands in, invaded the streets of Washington, D.C. that had record high temperatures of over 90 degrees. Um, so while global movements like these help create awareness, organizers say it's what we do on a day-to-day -day basis that truly plays a role in combating climate change. I'm always excited to talk about the People's Climate March. I, of course, participated in the last People's Climate March that happened uh, in at least the New York City one. Um, it's exciting. It's wonderful when people come together to talk about direct action. It's also another time when uh, groups sort of disparate groups that work in the environmental movement sometimes come together. You know, you get the sort of mainstream green organizations like the Natural Resources Defense Council, and then you get some of the indigenous um, organizations, environmental justice organizations, um, really the frontline communities all come together to um, talk about um, working towards um, a cleaner world and against climate change. Um, so. Moving on, we're going to start talking about um, an interesting story, an explosive story that's happened here 
Um, the Hawaii Senate refused to confirm uh, Gorak to the PUC. So the Hawaii Senate rejected Governor Ige's nomination of Tom Gorak to the three-member Public Utilities Commission on Friday night on a 15 to 10 vote. The rejection was seen by opponents as retaliation against the governor for opposing Florida-based Next, Next Era Energy's $4.3 billion bid to buy Hawaiian Electric Industries. So we're going to take a break and we'll come back and we'll talk more about the Gorak nomination. Aloha, I'm Kawi Lucas, host of Hawaii is my mainland every Friday at 3 p.m. on Think Tech Hawaii. We talk about things of interest to those of us who live here and my past blogs can be found at kawilucas.com. Okay, I didn't listen. Planning all week for the day of the big game. Watching at home just doesn't feel the same. What on the list is who's gonna drive? It's nice to know you're gonna get home alive. Plan for fun and responsibility. Choose the DT. Captain of our team. It's the DT. For every game day, assign a designated driver. Welcome back to Power Up Hawaii. I'm your host, Raya Salter. We talk about Hawaii come together, coming together to walk towards a clean, renewable, and just energy future. Before the break, we were talking about um, Tom Gorak's nomination being turned away um, on the Senate floor. Um, Tom Gorak was um, Governor Ige's nominee to be um, on the P Hawaii Public Utilities Commission. Um, so we'll go ahead and continue to talk about that. So, None of Gorak's opponents spoke on the Senate floor before the vote, but several of his supporters did. Um, this included um, Senator Gil Rivery from the North Shore, who cited Gorak's decades of experience and said he's exactly the person we need in the state of Hawaii to move us forward with our renewable energy portfolio. The environmental advocacy group Sierra Club and Earth Justice tried to drum up last-minute support for Gorak Friday, circulating a letter that emphasized his qualifications. Now, the vast majority of testimony at Gorak's confirmation hearing earlier this month was positive, with just three people opposing his, his confirmation. Friday's Senate session was supposed to start at 6.30 p.m., but was delayed by 40 minutes as senators discussed Gorak's nomination and other matters in the majority caucus room and met with deputy attorneys general. Because all the senators are Democrats, they all could participate in that discussion behind closed doors. Soon after the session started, the Senate called a recess for about 15 minutes, during which senators talked quietly to one another on the Senate floor and discussed pushing the vote back until next week. Now, Gorak served as legal counsel for the PUC for three years prior to his appointment by Ige in June. The appointment was controversial because it came just weeks before the commission was expected to vote on the next era deal. Former PUC Chair Her Hermina Morita challenged the appointment in court. Senate President Ronald Cucci filed an amicus brief in support. The case is ongoing. Gorak ended up recusing himself from the next era vote in July, and the two remaining commissioners rejected the sale. He has continued to serve on the PUC as an interim commissioner since then. Now, uh, Cucci backed a decision by a Senate committee led by Senator Rosalind Baker to recommend against accepting Gorak's nomination earlier this month by a vote of four free. In the committee report explaining why she rejected Gorak, Baker wrote that she agreed with his supporters that he is well qualified, but she wrote she had heard private information that she could not disclose discrediting Gorak's character. She also brought up how Gorak was appointed. Opponents again see the rejection as payback against Governor David Ige for opposing Next Era Energy's $4.3 billion attempt to buy Hawaii's utility. I don't actually have a lot to add to that story. Um, certainly explosive, certainly a, um, a publicly, a very public denial of um, Tom Gorak. Um, again, some call it payback against Governor Ige for um, the method and the effect of his, um, of, of, of the way that Ige placed him and what that meant to the next era deal and what that meant, I guess, to um, the chamber's sense of authority. Um, so I think, as Governor Ige said, you know, life goes on, and they are looking again 
for another commissioner to fill that seat. So we will closely follow what happens there. Let's talk a little more again about the People's Climate March. So many folks descended on the White House on, President's, uh, on President Trump's 100th day in office. So really, it was thousands of climate activists in D.C. trying to send a message to the president that climate change is real. It is ironic, or perhaps not, that Democrats, um, demonstrators, braved temperatures above the 90s mark in D.C. Saturday to march down Pennsylvania Avenue charting, chanting, water is life and keep it in the soil, can't drink oil. The gathering, already a familiar sight during Trump's nascent presidency, came together under the banner of the People's Climate March. Participants surrounded the White House complex and staged a choreographed sit-in, beating their chests a hundred times to symbolize both the president's time in office and the heartbeat of the environmental movement. Trump was in residence at the time, so the Sierra Club helped organize the event, which drew celebrities like Leonardo DiCaprio, former Vice President Al Gore, and climate and clean water activists like Mari Kopeni, best known as Little Miss Flint. So just talking a little more about the climate march, I think we've got a galvanized environmental movement, one that I'm proud to be a part of. I wasn't able to march in the sister march here, um, but uh, I look forward to continued advocacy and activism for um, climate, fighting against climate change, for energy justice, um, and climate mitigation, and clean and renewable energy for all. Go climate marchers. I was um, with you all in spirit. Now we'll move on to some other national news. So cool stuff, Atlanta becomes the latest city to commit to 100% renewable energy by 2035. Atlanta lawmakers approved a measure on Monday aimed at powering the city entirely on renewable energy sources, including solar and wind, by 2035. A resolution introduced by city council member and unanimously approved commits city government to develop a plan for transitioning all of its buildings to clean electricity sources by 2025 and for the entire city to go green a decade later. So folks there say, we know that moving to clean energy will create good jobs, clean up our air and water, and lower our residents' utility bills. So Hall, who's also a Democratic candidate for mayor, um, who's the city council person who brought this up, said in a statement, we never thought we'd be away from landline phones or desktop computers, but today we carry our smartphones around and they're more powerful than anything we used to have. We have to set an ambitious goal or we're never going to get there. So that's just really cool. Atlanta becomes the 27th U.S. city and the first in Georgia to pledge a 100% renewable energy goal, according to the Sierra Club. So we've talked several times before about aspirational goals, why I do still think that they're important. Um, and I think if we think about aspirational goals beginning to be meaningless, um, I think that it, it's in a good way because we're getting more and more folks who are committing to this and more and more folks, including folks here in Hawaii, are seeing that they can get to these goals even faster than we thought. So I think it's great. I also think that this is something that Hawaii might want to think about in particular as it relates to transportation. Um, we want to see um, more clean and renewable transportation happen in the state. And I think one clear way is for the state itself and for the cities and municipalities to take the lead on clean energy adoption, be it through public transit, be it through government buildings. I know that um, uh, Governor Ige recently did sign an energy efficiency bill for buildings that will also apply to government buildings. So um, great effort. Congratulations, Atlanta. Um, and we look forward to seeing um, what you guys do. Let's make it a race, a race to the top for clean and renewable energy. So another important news, it looks like the EPA and clean energy were spared Trump's axe in the $1.1 trillion budget deal that, uh, that, that the, the chambers came together with um, uh, very recently. So environmental programs marked for death or deep cuts by President Donald Trump got a reprieve in the government funding deal revealed early Monday by congressional leaders, at least for now. The EPA, targeted for a massive cut, almost a third of its funding, instead escaped with a budget trimmed by only 1% and no staff reductions. <laughs> I'm sorry. You know what? 
we're about to near the end of the program, but you know, it just goes to show, I laugh because I'm one of, I think, many people who, after the election, you know, it, talking about abolishing the EPA, pulling out of the Paris Agreement, it really felt like the environmental apocalypse. Um, and the thought of unified action to um, destroy the EPA, do things like repeal the Clean Water Act or the Clean Air Act or some of the language that was being bented around was so profoundly disturbing. And I think it's just I laugh because it turns out that the proof is in the pudding. We will see. Of course, it's too soon to tell. We have to take all of the, the threats to our clean energy agencies very seriously. But this one seems to not have materialized. So I think it also speaks to people power. Um, you, you keep your legislators accountable. Um, and they may very well respond. Nobody likes starving um, their districts of, um, of funds, which is what a lot of the Trump budget called for. So thank you once again. Thank you for joining me for another edition of Power Up Hawaii. Thank you so much and aloha.